I'd like to thank Brain and Behavior Research Foundation for inviting me to present some of my data. And the presentation is called Neuropeptide Y in Normal Brain Function and in Mood Disorders. And the overview of the presentation is peptides background, preclinical studies, clinical studies, and finally I wrap it up with a summary. Peptides background is a brief description of what peptides are. The proteins consisting of two or more amino acids linked in a chain. The carboxyl group of one amino acid is joined to the amino group of the next amino acid by so-called peptide bond. Peptides are present already in unicellular organisms, such as bacteria, that is preceding development of the brain, nervous system, and of course preceding dopamine and other known transmitters. Peptides are formed from large pro-hormones, progressively split by proteolytic enzymes into pro-hormones and lastly into peptides. They are stored in vehicles and released into circulation. The peptide family that I'm going to present today consists of three peptides and I will focus on neuropeptide Y, which is a 36 amino acid chain, phylogenetically well preserved. It's the most widely distributed peptide in the brain. It was discovered in 1982 at the Karolinska Institute. It's expressed in hypothalamus, the central nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, and also present in periphery, in platelets and pancreas. It, there are seven receptors for this peptide, and of importance to us is Y1, which is postsynaptic and enhances MPY release, and Y2, which is presynaptic and inhibits MPY release. And now I present some preclinical studies. The procedures that we have been using is we have been looking at baseline and controls, then we employed ECT, and we gave lithium power animals, and then we, of course, tested many antidepressants. Then we tested voluntary running in running wheels. Then we had a model of PTSD, and finally, we administered NPY directly into CNS or insufflated it via nebulizer. In order to be able to measure PET, neuropeptides correctly, there is a method called microwave irradiation. And the reason we are using it because it inactivates enzymes that metabolize peptides. And introduction of this method enable measurements of peptides in brain tissue before they were fragmented. Following extraction of peptides, we measure them by specific radioassays and reverse phase high performance actually, liquid chromatography HPLC in extracts of rat brain. Our conclusions were that using microwave irradiation, there are no additional immunoreactive components formed by microwave, which was good, and findings likely reflect a microwave-induced inhibition of peptidase activity. This method enabled assessment of basal peptides levels and, effectors, and effects of a variety of treatments. And now I will present some treatments. We started this electroconvulsive treatment, and there are two papers that were published at that time. We gave one or six ECTs or shame ECT. And what we found was that ECT significantly increased in PY in hippocampus. In the following paper, we could replicate our findings 
And moreover, we discovered that peptide concentrations were higher in the right brain hemisphere compared to the left brain hemisphere. So the conclusion was ECT increases MPY in selected brain regions, and there are significant differences in peptide levels between the right and left hemispheres. Then we used a convulsant, which is pentylene and tetrazole, and the reason we were using it because it induces grand mal seizures, which are similar to seizures induced by CT. And repeated grand mal convulsions induced by PTZ markedly increased antiviral concentrations in frontal cortex and hippocampus. Our conclusion was PTZ and ECT have similar effect on regional regional antiviral concentrations and the grand mal seizure, regardless of etiology, may be necessary for effects on peptides. Then we tested uh, diazepam and our question was, what happens if you give tranquilizers to, in this case, rats? So we, diazepam, diazepam pretreatment decreased the seizure time following ECS in a dose-dependent manner. However, diazepam did not modify the ECT-induced increase in NPY. Conclusion was confirmation that ECT leads to specific peptide increases in discrete red brain regions, and changes may not entirely be a consequence of seizures per se. Then we had, of course, to investigate the MPY that we extracted and purified. So we did a lot of several purifications methods. We used column chromatography techniques, gel permeation, chromatography, HPLC, iron pair, reverse phase HVC, and combined them with immunochemical methods based on an antacera directly towards two different epitopes of MPY. The conclusion was MPY that we extracted and purified consisted mainly of intact MPY 1 to 36, and we found no short C terminal homologs of MPY. The significant is that it has been previously shown that in intact MPY has different biological properties compared to the C-terminal homologs. Then we proceeded and tested effects of lithium on MPY, tachykinase, CJP in red brain, and as previously we used spray dolly rats, and we injected them with lithium sulfate, and then we extracted and measured peptides, and what we did find was that MPY was significantly increased in frontal and occipital cortex and striatum, and some other peptides like substance P and NK, MPY and NKA were also increased. Conclusion was lithium does equivalent, lithium in doses equivalent to those used clinically has a significant effect on MPY, substance P, NKA, CGRP in several brain regions, most prominently the striatum. And these findings rose the possibility that lithium's effect on neuropeptides are specific and may represent one of its mechanisms of action. Then we tested in a different model, we tested effect of lithium, electroconvulsive treatment and acetalopram. Rats are treated either with lithium placebo or citalopram placebo or ECT, sham ECT. We found that lithium increased levels of pre-pro NPY mRNA in hippocampus, and this increase was accompanied by an increase in extracellular levels of MPY in hippocampus of freely moving rats as determined by macrodialysis. The advantage of this microdiagnosis was that they, in fact, could demonstrate that peptides are 
released in freely moving rats and can be measured. Interestingly, effects of ECS were similar to those of leaching. However, in contrast, citalopram increased actually binding of one of the PYY compounds also in hippocampus and levels of MPY in the extracellular MPY in hippocampus were unaffected. So conclusion was the preclinical investigation shows that compounds and procedures exerting antidepressant effects in humans such as lithium, ECT, citalopram, all increase antibiotic neurotransmission in the hippocampus, but they do it by distinct modes of action. Of action. Then we got hold of von Hooded depressed rats from uh, NMH, and we compared three kinds of rats, von Hooded depressed rats, Vista rats and Sprague Dolly rats, and we also tested effects of ECT. And each of these rat strains received a series of six ECTs or sham ECTs. Peptides were extracted from brain regions and then measured with radium acid. Baseline and PY levels were lower in the hippocampus of the depressed rats compared to the other two strains. ECS increased NPY in hippocampus and frontal cortex of the strains tested. Our conclusion was, one, ECT increases NPY in depressed and controlled animals. The NPY increase was larger in the depressed strain. And results are in line with the hypothesis of decreased NPY in depression. And the one mechanism of ECT action is increased MPY. And here is a slide showing what I've been just talking about. You can see levels in hippocampus, frontal cortex in hypothalamus, in phone, hooded, food, vista, and SD rats. And as you can see, ECT increases MPY in those three levels, but the basal level of MPY was lowest in the depression. And then we got interested in uh, uh, alcohol, alcohol, and we got ethanol-naive alcohol preferring and non-preferring rats from uh, Scripps Institute in La Jolla and did some experiments. And the aim was to explore if brain and PY levels are affected by alcohol exposure and or correlated with genetic differences in preference for drinking alcohol. And then we compared NPY in alcohol naive, alcohol preferring strain and alcohol non preferring strain. And we found that prefer rats preferring, genetically preferring alcohol had actually lower NPY levels. So conclusion was that differences in NPY in limbic areas and frontal cortex between alcohol naive, alcohol preferring, and alcohol non preferring rats suggested that NPY may play a role in the risk for the development of alcohol preference, either by modulating the tension reduction properties of alcohol or by influencing consumatory behaviors. And now we switch to the genetic and epigenetic rat depression models. And first, I'll show a few slides referring to Flinders sensitive line rat. Flinders name comes from a university in Australia called Flinders University. And we received rats from Australia, from the Flinders University, and then we bet them in our lab and did a number of experiments. What is of interest is that when we compare our depression models 
that is genetically depressed rats, early life trauma effects on rats and patients. And we find uh, several, um, several measures, aspects that also I, HPA axis dysregulation could not be shown in genetically, in this genetically afflicted rat strain. Other characteristics of genetic depression, depression due to early life stress, and our findings in patients are very congruent. So you can see immobility swing test, psychomotor retardation, they all go up. So stress vulnerability is upgraded in all three, sensitivity to mascarinic agents, body weight and appetite is reduced in, in all three conditions, sexual drive is reduced, REM sleep is elevated, REM latency is reduced, cognitive difficulties in, in all three conditions, genetic, acquired, and patients. And last but not least, antidepressive treatments are affected in all three conditions. <clears throat> then we did some more experiments to check what's happening when we even look at receptors. And instead of using just radio, radio immunosis, we looked at gene expression by measuring messenger RNA. So we wanted to confirm our results using a gene expression method. And what we found was that reduced NPY expression plays a role in depressive disorder. Antidepressive effects of ECT are in part mediated through the NPY system. But what was perhaps of greatest interest was that lower NPY was found in female rats, and that is translational significance of significant of significance in view of the MDD gender differences. And here is a slide showing displaying what's happening, what's happening in hippocampus, and here is the control rats and depressed rats, and here you see male rats and female rats. And it's a similar slide from frontal cortex. And when we show the next slide, we see similar results. That is messenger RNA is also altered in hippocampus by electricity and difference between depressed and non-depressed animals. And we found that even NPY1 receptor is also altered. Then we continued and we felt that our findings are of such interest that we have to try to reproduce them in different labs. So we used rats that are bred at Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla and uh, another rat strain at the Radboud University in Holland, and finally rat strain bred at Galicia Institute in Stockholm. And the three rat strains were all exposed to early life stress. So now we have been moving from genetic models to early environmental stress, in our case, we use a method of early maternal separation. And what we did find was that early maternal separation alters NPY in selected brain regions in adult rats. And why is it of interest? Because early life adverse events have been identified as one risk factor in the development of psychopathology including depression in adulthood. In view of these findings, we hypothesized that brain and TY may also be decreased in an animal model of early life maternal separation. 
And here is a procedure that we use for male and female rats by separating them for a number of hours. Certain days in their early childhood. And it should be emphasized that it's only separations are not exposed to anything else but being removed from their dams. And what was the conclusion? The conclusion was that both male and female maternal separated rats had decreased and divided the hippocampus. And again, we confirm the genetic findings that NPY levels in hippocampus were significantly lower in the female rats. And that is of translational relevance for gender differences in MDD. And here is a slide showing uh, results from the rats that we obtained from Scripps Institute. And the most striking is the one in the middle. And here is a control female, female and control male, and there are differences in between control and maternally separated animals. And in addition, there are differences in females and males. So the effects of early life stress are in part gender dependent. And the next question was, is it very specific, or specific exclusively for MPY? So we measured a number of other peptides and as an illustration here, there's another peptide called CGRP, calcitonin generated peptide. And that was done in, in our lab. And what we did find was that maternal deprivation reduced NPY, but had no effect on CGRP in the hippocampus. However, when they exposed these rats to stress, to physical stress, stress reduced another peptide, CGRP levels in the hippocampus, regardless of maternal deprivation. So our conclusion was that NPY and CGRP respond selectively to the type of stressor. And NPY is uh, the peptide which primarily and specifically responds to psychological stressors. And here, uh, at, here is a table showing that NPY is not affected in hippocampus by rats that are bred on so-called grid, which is a stressor when they have to be housed on a grid, metal grid, but when they are exposed to metal separation, regardless of whether they've been exposed, exposed to grid or not, the NPY is inhibited, it goes down. In contrast, when we look at the CGRP, the effects, maternal separation, had no effects on CGRP in brain, but the effects of so-called grid stress was apparent. So there are not only, so measuring different peptides enables us to predict consequences of different kinds of stressors. In this, then we continue to test lithium, not only normal rats, but also in rats that are exposed to maternal separation in early childhood from for 15 or max 180 minutes per day during post postnatal days, two to 14, and later on checked at 50 to 83. And we again checked the number of peptides. The most striking results were changes in, in NPY levels. And what was of interest is that lithium pretreatment counteracted the effects of maternal separation in the hippocampus and striatum by increasing NPY levels. So early life stress has long term effects on brain and PY with implications for the development of depression. And one therapeutic mechanism of lithium 
is to increase brain and BY. And here you see the picture of maternal separation and rats exposed to lithium. Either for maternal separated for 15 minutes daily or for three hours daily. And the results are, as we predicted, decreased MPY and increased MPY by lithium treatment. Since there are different kinds of stressors, we also use the so-called chronic mild stress, and we also could show that rats exposed to three weeks of repeated unpredictable mild stress and CMS exhibited an increased self-stimulation threshold, reflecting the development of an anhedonic state, state which is regarded as an animal model of major depression. And then we did in situ hybridization and monitored mRNA levels of several peptides and found changes. And the conclusion was the findings show that peptide changes previously demonstrated in genetic rat models also occur in the stress-induced anhedonia model. And since it's generally considered that running is good for one's health, then we did conducted an experiment, voluntary running in running wheels. And we did find that running has differential effects on antiviral, opiates, and cell proliferation in Flinders sensitive line model of depression and controls. So we analyzed levels of, of, of mRNA encoding for neuropeptide Y as an opiate peptides, dynorphin and enkephalin in hippocampus, and correlated this to cell proliferation in main FSL and in the control FRL strain, with and without access to running wheels. I would like to point out that this is that they are housed in the, cages where they can just run whenever they feel like running. So it's really voluntary running. And running increased NPY, mRNA in dental gyrus and the CIA, CA4 region in the FSL, but not in the FRL rats. And FRL increase was correlated to increased cell proliferation. So conclusion was, running has different molecular effects in FSL depressed rats in their control FRL. And perhaps of greatest interest was that increases in MPY expression and cell proliferation in hippocampus were found only in the depressed strain. And here is just a behavioral picture of FSL when, when they don't run they are they uh, the so-called immobility is high when they start running they decrease their immobility if you are not depressed this does not work then we in addition to just testing running we tested also combination of running and acetalopram and looked at MPY receptors. So we com compared the effects of three long-term antidepressant treatments, acetalopram, voluntary running, and their combination on cell proliferation, NPY, and NPYY receptor. And again, we chose to test female rats because depression frequency is higher in women. And we found that hippocampal NPY expression and the NPY receptor expression were elevated by running and the combined treatment. And that correlations were found between NPY expression and, and behavioral changes. And the same was applied when it for NPY1 receptor. So conclusion was, treatments that were associated 
with an antidepressant-like effect, regulated hippocampal levels of mRNI, encoding antivirus, antiviral receptor, and support the notion that antiviral can stimulate cell proliferation and induce an antidepressant-like response. And here is just another slide visually documenting what we have found. That level, lower baseline antiviral level in uh, gyrus than, than tartus in depression and running increase in MPY and uh, MPY increase is correlated to cell proliferation. Our next step was to look at animal models of post traumatic stress disorder. And I'll show you some of the results that we have obtained. And the aim was to uh, discover whether there's an association between the magnitude of behavioral responses to stress and patterns of antiviral expression in the brain, and whether the central antiviral administration affects behavior in an animal model of PTSD. And the stressor is uh, cut scent, since rats are extremely sensitive to cut stress, it suffice to expose them just to cut scent for 15 minutes. And the, then behaviors were assessed in the elevated plus maze one week later. And what we found was that NPY protein levels were drastically decreased by exposure to cut strength, to cut stress, and the same applies to the MPYY receptors. So results, animals whose behavior was dis disrupted displayed NPY down regulation in the hippocampus, corresponding to the degree of disrupted behavior. One hour post-exposure treatment with NPY reduced prevalence rates of extreme behavioral response and reduced trauma cues freezing responses. So conclusion was brain and PY expressions reduced in PTSD and central and administration rescues the PTSD pathology. And here is a, a picture doc, uh, demonstrating these effects, and the more stressed the rats are, the so-called EPR, and if we, when you look at different brain regions, the rats that are most affected by cuts sent had larger decrease in, in, in MPY in their brains, and that was pervasive in contrast to depression, PTSD leads to pervasive decrease in MPY expression. And then we, in addition, we have been also doing some clinical studies, and I present briefly three kinds of studies, major depressive disorder patients, bipolar patients, and PTSD patients. And it starts with effects on uh, hospitalized patients with the MDD diagnosis, and there were lumbar puncture was before at base was performed at baseline and repeated after four weeks of citalopram treatment, and depression severity was assessed by HAM scale. And what we did find was this treatment with citalopram as was associated with a significant MPY increase and a significant CRH decrease in CSF. Conclusion, relationship between changes in concentrations of MPY and CRH and the clinical response shows significant correlation between these parameters. And here is a table, the published table demonstrating that CRH goes drastically down after treatment, MPY goes down, and percent changes demonstrated here. 
Then we did similar studies with inpatients also. This material came from a university hospital in Germany, and it, we got CSF before and after ECT treatment in hospitalized MDD patients, and then we looked at HVA and 5-HAA, which are classical measures, monoamine, monoamine measures, and we looked at, at MPY and found, as I just said, MPY, decre MPY increase and decrease in CRH. And findings of MPY increase and CRH decrease were similar to those following treatment with citalopram and are consistent with the preclinical data. And this indicates that the effects on NPY and CRH might constitute one of the common underpinnings of antidepressant treatment modalities. Then we turned the tables and we wanted to see what happens if there is exposure to negative or aggressive impulses of or persons who were diagnosed with impulsive aggression. And we got from University of Chicago, they collected some CSF for us, and the CSF was obtained from 40 subjects with personality disorder, and sugar subjects with 20 subjects with healthy, from healthy volunteers. Samples were assessed for MPY and other neurotransmitter-related species in CSF, and correlated with measures of aggression and impulsivity. And CSF, in contrast to the other kind of experiments, preclinical and clinical, with CSF, MPY was higher in personality disorder subjects compared with healthy volunteers. And in subjects with intermittent explosive disorder compared to subjects without intermittent explosive disorder. So conclusion, this data suggests a direct relationship between CSF and PY concentration and measures of impulsive aggression in human subjects. We were also interested to study bipolar patients and in a study conducted here at the Kalinska Institute, we had 120 patients, and we studied patients that attempted suicide, and we know that in bipolar patients, attempted suicide rate is 40 to 50 percent, accomplished suicide is about 20 percent, but no, so far, no biological markers that could predict suicide have been identified. So in view of the documented disregulation of the NPY system in depression, PTSD, and exposure to chronic stress, stress, the aim of this study was to explore if low NPY in CSF is associated with past suicide attempts, future suicide attempts, and the trait of anxiety. So the lumbar puncture was done, and MPY was determined. And then patients were re-examined one year after the lumbar puncture and suicide attempts were recorded. I would point out that the lumbar, that the lumbar puncture was done only once and the patients are then followed up by at least 12 months. And what they found was that MPY was significantly lower in bipolar patients with a history of suicide attempt compared to patients who had not attempted suicide prior to lumbar function. MPY was significantly lower in patients who attempted suicide during the follow-up period compared to the patients who did not. And lastly, patients who attempted suicide during the follow-up also had significantly lower MPY than those with previous suicide attempts who did not re-attempt suicide. So conclusion was, our results suggest 
that low MPY in CSF predicts future suicide attempts. And the last part of my presentation is going to be development of principal novel treatment for MDD and PTSD with MPY insufflation. And the, and the randomized dose ranging study of MPY insufflation in patients with PTSD was done at Mount Sinai School of Icon School of Medicine in New York, and the paper was published in 2018. And 26 individuals diagnosed with PTSD were randomized in a crossover single ascending dose study into different into one of the five cohorts and assessments were conducted at baseline and following a trauma, trauma script, symptom provocation. And what we, did, what we did find was that there was a significant interaction between treatment and dose. Higher doses of MPY were associated with a greater treatment effect failing MPY over placebo on back anxiety factor score. So conclusion was that a single dose of insufflated MPY is well tolerated up to 9.6 milligrams and is associated with anxiolytic effect. Then we conducted a con randomized control trial of again of in inter insufflated intranasal MPY in patient with MDD, and this study was done, carried out at Karlinska Institute. We had 39, 30 patients on a stable dose of a conventional antidepressant, antidepressant, so we did not change their regular treatment, but they were tested because they did not respond to their conventional antidepressant treatment. And uh, then we, we assessed effects of MPY at plus 1, plus 5, plus 24, and plus 48 hours. And the primary outcome was change in depression severity, measured with a Montgomery Osper depression rating scale. And we found that depression was superior to placebo at plus for 24 hours after MPY inhalation, and at plus 5 hours plus MPY inhalation. So conclusion was, since no results regarding the trajectory of MPY effects exists, existed prior to the study, we extrapolated from the known MPY biology and predicted that the effects will occur in the interval 5 to 48 hours post insulation. We chose post 48 hours as a primary endpoint and plus 1, plus 5, and plus 24 hours as secondary endpoints. The results, the first of their kind, indicate that insulated antivirus antidepressant and call for those ranging and repeated antiviral insufflation trials. So what are the main points of our studies? Antivirus found in brain and periphery of vertebrate animals and plays a role in many physiological processes in prelude clinical experiments and device reduced in brain of animal models of depression and in PTSD. Early life adverse events reduce brain MPY expression and antidepressant treatment modalities like SSRI, lithium ECS, and running in running means voluntary running, rescues the altered behavior and restores the decreased MPY levels in brain. Translationally, this is a remarkable, there is a remarkable congruence between the clinical and preclinical findings. Decrease NPY in CSS, in CSF from MDD and PTSD patients and decreased NPY in rat brain models. Two, increased NPY in CSF from MD, MDD patients following antidepressants and DCT and increased NPY expression in animal brains following antidepressants and ECS in patients. Significant correlation 
between antibody increase in CSF and decrease in depression symptoms, and in animal models, significant correlation between increased antibody expression and decreased depression-like behavior. The next point is that lower level, low level of antibody and CSF from bipolar patient, patients indicates a risk for suicide attempt. And last but not least, preclinical and clinical data on dysregulated MPY system in depression and PTSD and beneficial effects of MPY in this disorder, support, supported by two trials of MPY insufflation, the first of their kind, call for development of MPY as a potential treatment for MPY and PTSD. This is the end of my presentation. I'm really happy and grateful that BBR Research Foundation allowed me or invited me to present some of my data at this Zoom symposium.